those that they want to say something, please feel free to, as I said, chip in. But um, what I highlighted here in terms of language diversity areas were the ones that really stick out in terms of sheer numbers. It does not mean that those are the only places in the world where we have concentration of languages and, uh, and diversity, ethnicities and cultures. Uh, I mean, uh, the question was about India. I never mentioned India as a subcontinent because in terms of sheer concentration, it does not make it as much as I want. And uh, I will be talking about other areas in the world, uh, apart from India, uh, where uh, there are uh, there, there is um, convergence of different languages and cultures. The Balkans, in Balkans, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, Southeast Asia uh, is another one. Mesoamerica. Uh, they're all different. Contact has not always been happy. There is contact, and uh, as a result of this contact, uh, there is convergence of medical structure. Um, India is another example, but. Uh, I highlighted here the areas where there are many varieties of some, something that is being spoken by people and that these varieties are in serious, realistic danger of disappearing within our generation. Um, and nobody should feel excluded from this. Um, a bird out, bird like you. Um, what's out. Um, it was not an exhaustive view. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to continue with, uh, with possible genealogical language classifications, how you classify the languages of, in the world and how you catalog them. That, those are two different things. Uh, genealogical classification refers essentially to historical linguistics. You put uh, languages together uh, based on uh, usually data uh, from grammatical structure and what has been identified as conservative lexicon. As a conservative lexicon, you usually take uh, pronouns, numerals, uh, things that don't change easily. So, um, <coughs> this is a, 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 in a genealogical classification, usually the ambition is to be able to reconstruct a proper language based on what data you have from modern languages. Um, another way to classify it when you, when you see that there is no possible uh, common ancestor, you group languages based on the geographical area. So, uh, Papua is one uh, such uh, um, example, the Caucasus is another. Um, no common ancestor is possible. And, uh, but uh, Turkic is, uh, there is no question, like there is a proper Turkic language, there is a proper European language, uh, there is a proper Dravidian language, so uh, these are examples of uh, genealogical groupings. Um, I've listed on the handout um, classifications that used to be used until the 90s. Um, uh, they are Vogelin and Vogelin and uh, Rulin uh, and then Barbara Grimes. Um, the, they are, um, they are um, nowadays, I mean, of the three that were current, at least in the English speaking gold scholarships, uh, those two are kind of obsolete nowadays. They, uh, they were, they're all done by people and their world, so all of these um, cover the world, all, the, all three of them. Um, and they're obsolete because they never made it any further, there has been any, any development. Um, um, in the sense that, you know, Rulin classified all languages spoken in the Americas uh, he um, stated that they all should go back and somehow have the hypothesis that there was a something called Amerind, so Amerind family, 
that you could never uh, argue for a ancestor. Now there is a lot, I mean, since 87, there a huge amount of work has been done on the languages <coughs> of the Americas, so nobody believes in Amharic anymore. So it's one of the reasons why Wulin wiped out, and, uh, and the same as uh, Vogelin and Vogelin never postulated any um, Amharic. Uh, but again, they, a classification is never written in stone. Uh, classification is something that uh, a historical linguist suggests at a certain point in time uh, based on the data that they have. Uh, and it's uh, a natural thing in science to always revise what people have arrived at. So, uh, for instance, nowadays uh, the Dravidia family um, has traditionally been um, split into northern, um, south central, and uh, uh, south. Uh, the northern uh, branch consists of at least one language that's way out in Pakistan. All, all the other Dravidian languages are, are spoken in central and um, southern parts of India. Uh, there, I mean, the northern Dravidian language is very, Brahui is very different from uh, the remaining languages. So people, I mean, Brahui is questioned as a Dravidian language. So maybe these people were uh, close to Dravidian speaking people, so that they ended up in, in Pakistan. Uh, and they stayed there, uh, but uh, the Dravidian, so the unity of what has been known as Dravidian is questioned, and that's natural to, to happen. Uh, if these things are not revised in the classification, and the classification is not being open to uh, new things, then it eventually gets out of use. Um, this one survives, and uh, it survives in the form of the ethnologue, um, I'll be referring to the ethnologue. The ethnologue is the product of the Summer Institute of Linguistics, uh, which is a American-based organization. Uh, they are missionaries uh, who go around and translate the Bible into different languages. So, um, regardless of what you think of their views of the world and what they do, uh, they, what they do, apart, I mean, they, obviously there, there is a very outspoken, clear goal why they go to the places where they do. Uh, but with, with that in mind, uh, we may question it, uh, we may oppose it. They have also produced an outstanding amount of grammars, so for that we thank them. As linguists, we are, so they put this classification online, um, I'll be, and they did something else too that the linguistic community was very jealous and angry about because they were, uh, so I evoked uh, the live version of the ethnologue uh, online. If we go down, so I have to sift through a bunch of ads. Uh, what do they do here? Uh, there is no need to register, that's stupid. Um, I want to go to the search function. we don't agree on this family, we don't agree on another family, 
At the same time, the missionaries put out their thing. And their thing made it into libraries. Because if you go, um, so I'll show you why. Um, you can browse by many things, by language name, by language family. Uh, but they also were aware of the fact that a language can be referred to by many different names. Uh, when you catalog, and this is where I'm drifting out from the sheer grouping of languages, whether they come from a common ancestor or whether they're spoken in one of the same area, into how we um, catalog our knowledge about them. And that's, that's how we refer to, 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 to things. So, if we look at the Altai family, which I believe should be closest to you, and maybe I think actually is not too bad, what, I mean, you get a tree of what they think is Altai, and you don't have to agree, but you have it there, and you can send them opinions, and uh, they will argue with you, but eventually it will change. Uh, that if you provide good arguments, they will change uh, to whatever you expressed. So you browse through the different branches, and it tells you which branch that is and how many languages are in it. So um, we go and we will come down to Turkic, and we see their idea of what Turkic is. So if we choose like a, some language, say, short. Okay. It's, it says that it's a northern Turkic language of Russia. Um, it lists the alternative names. So this is something that they got. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge problem when you start comparing languages because it lists what other names exist for referring to shore. And uh, it has a three-letter code that is called now the International Standard and the number of the International Standard Code that is used in libraries to uh, refer to shore in a, in a bigger way. So if a library has a grammar that is about ABBA and they know that that ABBA refers to the same language that's called shore, they will catalog it by this code. So this code becomes a link that people can use in their databases. So if I have data on Shore, and I refer to Shore as, say, Kuznets Tata, and Ayo has data on Shore, and he refers to it as Shore, if we use this, we can connect our data sets. And people can search in a meaningful way and find the same things. So that was something very smart the, the SIL people did, because they entrenched themselves in the electronic libraries and catalogs in the world. It's their code system that is being used. They have codes for about 6,000 languages of the world. And what they, they want to sell, they want to make one of these language, which we don't always agree. But the point is, and this is something that we have to take from it, I mean, some things don't have always have to be perfect, but you have to make your data or whatever you're doing accessible to the world. Make it known that this is what you do. And uh, um, share in order to become uh, cited. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, if you're staying in science, uh, anywhere you go, uh, sometimes it doesn't matter so much how much you produce, but how much impact you have. So the important thing is to if you have one article, that article is so good that everybody has to refer to it. It doesn't mean you have to retire, but you're doing well, you know. So, um, I mean, they list, uh, they, they have a bunch of things that they, apart from the language names and the codes that are, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, are there, uh, some, something really strong that they, they list where they think the language is spoken and how many people speak it. Um, and uh, if it's more of them, if it's alive, um, stuff about the writing system, um, and um, any, 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 any other kind of, kind of comments. So if you, if you have opinions, you log in, uh, or you, and it's not, it's very, um, you can register, they, they're asking for your email address and stuff, so it's not any 
like our registration, but then you can talk to them. The problem we have with, with them is that they respect their stuff and their stuff alone. You have to talk directly to, to them to change anything. Um, there is another classification uh, that came out recently, and that's the model log. Um, this is a product uh, of the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. I hope the live version here. Uh, um, and um, it's a computational linguist with no training in linguistics, but uh, a, a huge interest in language uh, who started it. His name is Hammer Karl Hammerstrom. Uh, and uh, a group of people he got together uh, in the Max Planck Institute. Um, so they designed a catalog that's um, scientifically, I think, uh, much better than the ethnologue. So if I um, if I look for the same language, say short, if you can search in different ways. Where is there? Okay, so then. It tells me who told them that shore should be classified this way, so the sources for this classification. Um, it shows me a map that I can manipulate further where shore is believed to be, to be spoken. Um, it links to all other online databases where shore is mentioned. It links directly to the entry. Uh, that includes the ethnologue as well. Um, if there is any interest, I can go through language archives at some other point. Okay. But that will, if, uh, or we can take it in the question period. Uh, but if I'm, if I'm to go through all of this now, it will divert me from what I want to say. So um, I'll, uh, I'll cut it short. Um, <coughs> It gives you, oops, sorry. Okay, it gives you the sources that they they have, uh, Harold and his colleagues, the sources that they have for sure, what kind of um, description it is, and who supplied it to them. If it's Carl, if it's the World Bank of Language Structures, if it's somebody else. Um, so I think it's a, and uh, they have their own code, but of course, I mean, since the envelope code is a standard, they, they use that. Uh, they're not exclusive, they, they include everything there is, and this is why I think that scientifically it's a better catalog. Why am I mentioning these two catalogs? Uh, I mean, I'm going to be asking you to go and work uh, with grammars of specific languages. I'm going to be talking about classifications and how to select languages next time. Um, if you are in typology, uh, catalogs like this are essential for typological research. Uh, this is not the only place where you find information, but nowadays is, this is where you start. Um, and then you, then you go on. Um, so, so much for language cataloging. I'll be coming back. You know. So, 
this is our base on what we stand. We know how many approximately what the state of the language situation in the world is and we know where to find our information. Um, what um, <laughs> language typology is that? I mean, someone like me, as I told you, I went into typology because I wanted to see the world. Uh, so it's a worldwide, worldwide language comparison. You choose the parameter. I will be showing what I took my first uh, worldwide study. It was a body of numerals because I thought it was going to be fun. Uh, basically, any any phenomenon that you can justify is interesting, can be studied uh, from a comparative perspective. Um, you will have to select something that you believe is a representative number of languages from around the world. And I'm going to be talking a lot about how you go about selecting and what you include and what you don't include. Um, another definition of typology is uh, any systematic study of variation. So it doesn't have to do so much with uh, the world. I mean, you can, you can still do typology. You can do a typology of a single family. It's still typology as long as your studies.